15307 called characterization of PM 2.5 episodes in the wintertime San Ysidro Express in aircraft measurements. This is carried out by Professor Chris Kapp and Chi Zhang from UC Berkeley. First, I have to make a couple of announcements. Um, for those of you online, questions for the speaker can be sent to the website Sierra RM at kellypa.ca.gov. We also need to cover the exits in case of a fire alarm. These are located to the front, uh, right and left of this room, and we're, we're required to evacuate immediately. Uh, so please don't exit down the stairway and gather at a relocation site across the street. First, I'd like to maybe give a couple of um, introduction slides um, to place where the uh, study took place, as well as maybe what, what why it's important. And um, <clears throat> the, this first slide gives a general overview of the San Joaquin Valley in California. And um, basically, it's bounded. It's a long valley, about 250 miles long and 80 miles wide. And it's bounded by um, mountains to the uh, the east, uh, the Sierra Nevada and the west, the, the coastal range and the south, the Tehachapi. And um, so this restricts the air movement <coughs> through the Sacramento-San Joaquin River Delta through the Bay Area. And um, basically, um, uh, causes the air to um, stagnate the further down you you get in, in the valley. Um, during the wintertime, low mixing heights and stagnant conditions can limit the um, escape of the air and limit the vertical and horizontal transport of pollutants, <coughs> and, which allows the pollutants to accumulate over time. So in, in this plot, we show um, the PM 2.5 uh, averages over several years from 2013 to 2016. I believe a similar slide uh, occurs in Chris's talk. And this, the uh, red dots show <coughs> daily average exceedances of 35 micrograms per cubic meter. And you can see that these occur, <coughs> all of these occur during the winter months. Um, so this is the time when you have very low um, mixing heights as well as uh, weak advection in the valley, allowing buildup of uh, various pollutants to occur. And, and um, during the talk, uh, and from PM measurement studies, about half of the PM is nitrate, particulate nitrate, and about half is organic matter. And the particulate nitrate is, is produced through oxidation of NOx emissions from vehicles, essentially, um, converting it to ammonium nitrate. So this project elucidated the coupling between the meteorology and uh, particle formation with an emphasis on nitrate formation in the valley. And these such studies as this, especially this detailed one that characterized two particle buildup events are, are needed for um, regulatory efforts to comply with particulate matter standards in the San Joaquin Valley. Um, I'd like to Welcome our speaker, uh, Dr. Kepper is a professor and vice chair of the Civil and Environmental Engineering Department the, at the University of California, Davis, and is currently a chancellor's fellow. Dr. Kepper received his PhD from the University of California, Berkeley in physical chemistry in 2005. Currently, um, Dr. Kepper's group at UC Davis is working on a mixture of laboratories, experiments, field measurements, and conceptual model development. And with the, most of this research is focused on the understanding information and properties of organic aerosols, interactions between particles and water, and the relationship between composition and light absorption and extinction properties of atmospheric aerosols. Please join me in welcoming Professor Kappa. Thanks, William, and thanks everybody for coming out today. Um, oh, I have to switch, switch.
All right. Um, so I'm going to talk today very quickly um, about some of the work that we did to uh, better understand PM 2.5 episodes in the wintertime San Joaquin Valley. And this is largely based on measurements made, or entirely based on measurements made during the Discover AQ uh, study in 2013. Um, before I dig into the, to everything, I need to thank everybody who contributed. Um, my uh, uh, co-I on this is uh, Chi Zhang. Uh, and then the work was, was uh, really carried out by a talented team of, of scientists. Um, uh, all of whom have sadly graduated and left us, but um, or were postdocs to start. Um, so I just want to give thanks to all of them, and then of course to the Discovery AQ uh, team, who this wouldn't have been possible without. Um, if you're interested in more details, there's our report, of course, as well as a few papers uh, that we published based on this work. And I'm going to focus largely today on on results from this first paper uh, and this third paper here, uh, in reverse order. Um, so, as William said, right, there is a, a, a challenge with PM 2.5 in the wintertime San Joaquin Valley. Here's an even longer record uh, showing things up to uh, just a couple weeks ago. This is the fires that we just had. But you can see uh, kind of this persistent wintertime uh, pollution that we get where the, the PM 2.5 uh, levels are exceeding uh, the EPA uh, daily standard. And, and then the annual averages resulting from this are often above the EPA standard as well. This is for the Fresno Garland site, but you'll see something similar throughout uh, the valley as well. And we're interested in trying to understand uh, exactly what's driving this to quantify those effects and to come up with uh, and to help uh, guide uh, uh, regulatory solutions. Uh, we can see that here also if we take an annual average uh, uh, of those of all those profiles, you can very clearly see. The increases in the winter months. Uh, I, I noticed you actually see this little bump in in uh, August as well. That's probably a fire season uh, coming in as well. And <clears throat> just to emphasize here, uh, some of this is this is really a valley wide problem, and we'll come back to this here. But this is a satellite image, and and you can really see uh, on this day here the the smog uh, kind of throughout the valley there, and even uh, getting into the San uh, Francisco Bay there a little bit as well. So this is not just an issue in Fresno, although we're going to use Fresno today as our case study, largely. Um, but this is a, a, an issue throughout the, the San Joaquin Valley. So our project objectives, uh, uh, in the end, were to use both aircraft and ground measurements and to bring these together uh, from the NASA Discovery AQ uh, study to really try to elucidate the sources that contribute most to PM 2.5 uh, episodes. Uh, to improve our understanding of the processes, really, that lead to the buildup of pollution during, during the wintertime pollution episodes, and to use all of this to really try to update the conceptual model for PM 2.5 formation uh, in the valley. And we had a couple different tasks to achieve those objectives, look at the, basically look at the data, model the data, and update our conceptual model. So, um, you know, I've mentioned Discover AQ here a few times. I'm going to... Tell you a little bit about this study, kind of the, the, the data that we have available. Uh, this was a really nice study conducted in January and February of 2013, uh, coordinated by, by NASA. Uh, and we had uh, both aircraft and ground measurements. Um, the ground measurements, uh, there was a number of, of, of sites where, where basic measurements were made, but Fresno was what, what we might consider a super site, where my group was, Cheese group was, and, and a number of other people were there bringing a whole bunch of instruments there. So we had a, a, a wide uh, variety of instruments that aren't usually available uh, on the ground uh, in Fresno here. And then we also had uh, aircraft measurements that were flying. Uh, and you can kind of see the, the, the route here. So uh, they'd start down uh, uh, here and then fly up over Bakersfield, uh, over Porterville, Corcoran, uh, Hanford, Huron, Tranquility, Fresno, and then back to Bakersfield. And they would actually repeat this pattern three times a day on, on many of the days of the campaign. There's a couple days where they flew elsewhere. But they did this three times a day, usually kind of in the, in the early to mid-morning, right? the kind of mid-afternoon and the late afternoon here. So this gives us a perspective on how things evolve as well, doing kind of this repeating pattern. And over each one of these cities that I have highlighted here, they would do a vertical profile. So they'd fly between them, and then they'd fly up and down. Uh, over each city so we can kind of understand what the vertical distribution looks like 
and how that evolves. And so we're going to take advantage, uh, a lot of advantage of that data, especially in the second part uh, of this talk here. Um, so what did we, what did we have available uh, during these studies? So on the ground site, we had a, a, a high-resolution aerosol mass spectrometer that allowed us to make uh, high-time resolution measurements of particle uh, composition, at least the non-refractory particle composition here. So that includes major inorganic ions here, nitrate, sulfate, and ammonium, as well as uh, organic aerosol. We measured black carbon uh, at the surface as well and size distributions uh, and a whole bunch of other things, particle scattering, particle extinction, uh, total PM. Uh, and then we also had a, a variety of gas phase and meteorological measurements, NO2, ozone, NO, SO2, a lot of the standard ones. Uh, we also had available um, uh, VOC measurements from a proton transfer reaction mass spectrometer on some gas uh, canister sampling that was done, and then your standard uh, meteorological modeling and uh, some measurements of ammonia as well, which proved very, very helpful. These were uh, slow measurements here, only made twice a day. Uh, integrated, but the rest are, are largely very fast measurements uh, overall. On the aircraft, there were actually two aircraft that were flying. Uh, one of them carried kind of instruments that measured the in situ air, uh, and so we, we were focused there on the, the particulate matter, so we had scattering uh, and particle hydroscopicity or their water uptake from which we can derive uh, particulate nitrate, uh, or we can at least estimate a, a, a measurement of particulate nitrate concentrations. Size distributions, we had slow measurements of inorganic ion concentrations as well. So we had kind of a, a slower measurement, you know, a five-minute integrated average, which isn't very good for vertical profiles, but is good when you're just flying a level leg. And then a way to estimate faster uh, uh, concentrations or concentrations faster as well. Uh, gas phase and MET as well, NO2, ozone, all those standard things, including ammonia again and, and uh, nitric acid here. Um, and then we had separately uh, a plane flying uh, that was doing more remote sensing, looking at PM backscattering profiles uh, throughout the valley. So this gives us a sense of kind of, again, what that vertical distribution looks like uh, everywhere that they were, they were flying, not just when they were doing the vertical profiles as well. And so I'm not going to show measurements from all of these things here today, but we kind of integrated all of these into our thinking about everything. We've looked at all of this, and so I'm going to kind of talk about what we distilled all of this down uh, into. Okay. So what does this give us? Uh, the, the ground measurements, just to kind of compare, we get um, kind of a continuous time series. So I'm just illustrating this with our particulate nitrate measurements here in blue. So you see a continuous uh, a time series there of measurements. So we get that, you know, every, every minute or every five minutes at the ground. And then illustrated in gray are the days when, we, when, we, when the aircraft were flying and would do vertical profiles. So they didn't fly every day, but they flew many days, and including, importantly, many days where they flew, say, a couple days in a row. So we could actually look at how things evolved day after day. That proved very, very useful. And what we get over a given site, besides getting the wide spatial picture, is over a given site, we get things like this. This is a vertical profile in our estimated nitrate concentration uh, in the morning here in black. In the midday, so around noon here in blue, and then in the afternoon here in red, and you can see a large change in what that looks like, right, over time. And we're going to come back to that later. That turns out uh, that it's particularly important. Okay. So I'm going to break this into two parts here. One is focused a little bit more on the ground measurements, uh, and then one is focused on more of an integration between the ground measurements uh, and the aircraft measurements to inform uh, particulate nitrate. So if we start with the, the, the ground measurements, and we look at the, the period that uh, we were sampling, uh, we really had what amounts to two major pollution episodes. One that started basically right when we started. Uh, um, so we have kind of uh, the, the PM kind of continuously building up. These are measurements in Fresno here. Uh, the PM continuously building up over that, that period. Uh, then the weather changed and things kind of got washed out, a little bit of rain. Uh, and then we saw another buildup here in the this, in this second episode. Overall, so we have two episodes that we can kind of mine to understand the behavior. And if we if we look not just at Fresno, so these are PM two point five measurements from the the um, ARB network, 
uh, uh, throughout uh, the Central Valley. You can see kind of this, these are the daily averages in the black now. You can see this, this general behavior at all sorts of different sites here, right? Throughout the valley and I put, and I took kind of the, the typical average value here at the peak of this uh, first event here and plotted all of those uh, for the entire valley here. Uh, and you can see that, you know, really the, the, the episode, right, these elevated values are observed throughout the entire valley, right? So this is not uh, uh, specific to one city, um, although concentrations might be a little enhanced over the cities, but it is uh, certainly a valley-wide uh, issue overall. As soon as you get up just a little bit into the, into the mountains there, the concentrations fall off tremendously. And just looking a little bit more at kind of the spatial distribution, this valley-wide uh, impact as well. So these are some measurements made from the aircraft and, and that Sally Pusetti uh, published here. So on the left is the total nitrate um, uh, measured when the plane was flying below 400 meters. So kind of in the well-mixed part of the uh, atmosphere near the surface. And what you see is that, um, notice the lower limits here only 10, so you see you know, lower values kind of between cities and then elevated values a bit within the cities in terms of the particulate nitrate. So it's not that it's zero in between the cities, but it's, it's lower in, in general here. Um, and then you see other areas of, of enhancement there. Um, and if we look at the, the NOx as well, kind of that source of nitrate that William mentioned, you see that that tends to be elevated over the cities, but is, you know, spread out across the entire valley there as well, so there's a, there's a gradient. But if we look at ammonia, an important component of particulate nitrate formation, again, relatively high levels kind of everywhere, but, but certainly some areas where you see uh, elevated concentrations, that has to do with exactly the activities that are going on on the ground, right? So we have kind of the spatial picture, but we can use, and I'm gonna argue, we can use at least uh, individual cities or individual locations to understand the general processes that are going on that control uh, the valley-wide pollution because, right, we see this, these valley-wide events uh, overall. So if we look at uh, what we observed in Fresno during Discovery AQ, and I'm just going to break it into these two pollution episodes, uh, episode one and, and episode two here, um, what we see is that about half or a little over half of the total particulate matter, this is PM1 in this case, although we didn't see very much between one and 2.5 uh, microns from some other measurements, so this is nominally PM2.5. Um, we see that it's about half organic, and then, you know, 40% uh, here or so uh, uh, with nitrate and ammonium. So the sum of that blue and that orange there is our ammonium nitrate. And if we look over here during period two, we see something very similar, right? Kind of this consistent picture between these two uh, episodes Right, nominally uh, 50, 60 percent uh, organic, and, and nominally uh, 40 percent uh, inorganic, with that uh, ammonium nitrate dominating overall. Okay. So one of the things that we can do by having kind of the faster measurements, the fast uh, time resolution measurements of particle composition, is we can look at how these different components vary with time of day, which actually can tell us a lot about the sources and, and, the, and the processes that form them. And so what I'm showing here are the, the campaign average diurnal profiles for, um, on, on the upper left here, for black carbon, for organic uh, aerosol, uh, and then for the various inorganic uh, species as well. And what we see is that the black carbon and the organic carbon show this very notable uh, increase at night, right? We actually see that in chloride as well. Okay? But if we look at these other inorganic ions, especially the, the, the nitrate and the ammonium nitrate here, right, we see a very different pattern with this increase uh, during the day. Right? Very different behavior. This tells us that there's different sources, right? And we can see that because we have the high time resolution composition measurements, not just a one in one in three daily average measurement, right? Or if we just look at the total PM diurnal behavior, it's actually relatively flat because when this goes up, these go down, right? So the total PM doesn't tell you as much as the composition resolved measurements. 
And what we find is that these secondary components, yeah, they have a daytime peak, and the primary components, or the things that are more primary, tend to peak at night. You can see rush hour there, too, for the black carbon. So we can also think about the size distributions, kind of where these materials exist within the, the particulate matter. This tells us about sources and processing as well. And what we find is if we look at the inorganic ions, so this is the campaign average here. So if we, if we could squint and see the red and the blue and the orange lines, right, they basically all overlap here to a large extent. And they tend to be predominantly in this larger accumulation mode up here. If we look at the organic, you also see stuff up that, that large, but you also see this larger tail down to the smaller mode overall in the average. And these plots on the right are a little harder to read, but the now diameters on the, on the y-axis, and this, each, each curve here is a size distribution uh, for, in this case, ammonium, sulfate, nitrate, and organics uh, for every two hours of the day. And the thing to take away from this is that the, the inorganic ions, the size distribution is pretty constant. There's not much changing. They just kind of hang out in the accumulation mode. But if we look at the organics, we actually see that the, the shape of the size distribution is shifting throughout the day. Right? It's changing throughout the day, which is suggesting that there's differences in sources in terms of the contributions uh, throughout the day uh, overall, whereas these are you know, relatively uh, constant, even though we see that increase in concentration, say, uh, uh, during the daytime versus the nighttime. So let's think a little bit about these, a little bit more about these organic species then. So uh, what, what uh, Chi did is uh, performed a, a positive matrix factorization on the organic aerosol uh, mass spectral time series from which you can, you can take the uh, organic aerosol um, uh, concentrations and, and composition and turn it into different uh, factors. So these correspond to nominally types of, of, of organic aerosol, right? And what we find is that there are, are four types or four factors that we might associate with primary emissions here. So one is what, what we termed a hydrocarbon-like organic aerosol uh, or HOA. That's really a vehicle-associated one in this, in this region, most likely. Um, and I'm sure Sonia will correct me if I'm wrong. We have our cooking-related uh, OA here, so that's as the name implies, probably from cooking. Right? Notice it's a pretty substantial fraction here uh, in the end. And then we actually see two different types of factors that we, can, uh, that we attribute to biomass burning based on the chemical signatures of these factors here. Um, and, and so these have distinct uh, uh, chemical, chemical signatures suggesting that they're both from biomass burning but uh, slightly different in their, in their composition uh, overall. This biomass burning here in the end is largely residential wood combustion in the wintertime there. Um, there weren't any big fires like we just had going on at the time. Then we also have, besides these primary factors, we have two secondary factors, or what we think are secondary factors here. Uh, these, these more oxygenated organic aerosols, and we break these down into what we call a semi-volatile and a low-volatility uh, organ oxygenated uh, organic aerosol. Overall, these, you know, these make up about a third or more, 40% uh, of the total uh, organic aerosol in the end. So the primary make up a large fraction, right, you know, 60% or so, but these secondaries, we can't really ignore these at all. And I'll just mention that the source of these secondaries, right, the exact precursors of these, we have a lot less information on that still coming out of this. Um, these seem pretty straightforward. These there's still, still some work to do there. So why might I call these you know, um, primary versus secondary? Well, we can, we can look at the diurnal profiles, again, of these particular uh, OA factors. And for example, the primary ones on the right here, we see that the hydrocarbon-like one, right, the one that I said is vehicle-associated, peaks at night as well, and then shows this very distinct um, uh, rush hour bump over here. Right, the, the cooking-related one uh, peaks at night as well, much lower, lower bump there. Right, this, and then these biomass burning ones also peak at night with some, uh, some distinct behavior here uh, overall with a little bit of a bump there. 
You can contrast that with the, the secondary ones on the left, right, where we have um, the, the, the more semi-volatile one, shows a little bit of a, a bump in the day. And the low volatility one is there's maybe a bump during the day, but it's relatively constant, right? The thing about these two is they, they're, they tend to be much more uh, flat with time of day than the other things, suggesting more of a regional uh, influence in, in the end, a local influence. And just to kind of drive the, the difference in, in sources uh, home here, if we look at the uh, size distributions of the HOA here in gray, the biomass burning in brown, right, and the cooking in blue, and the oxygenated organic aerosol factors combined here in pink, right, we see that all of these have different size distributions reflecting the different emissions and processes and, and formation uh, in the end. And you might notice that this, this oxygenated one tends to look a fair amount like those secondary inorganics that we saw earlier as well, suggesting a secondary uh, uh, contribution overall. A um, couple more things that we were able to tease out from all of this is we were there for long enough and the data were consistent enough that we were able to make reasonable comparisons between weekday and weekend behavior. And we often think that there might be differences between uh, what's emitted on a weekend versus a weekday, largely driven by cars um, or trucks. There's a lot fewer trucks on the road on the weekend than there are on the weekdays. And we can see that that plays out in terms of, of the diurnal profiles of some of these uh, different species, both in terms of the, the um, particulate matter on, on these top two rows, some of the key uh, gas phase species or VOC species down here. Um, and so, for example, black carbon, which we'd expect to have a contribution from things like trucks and cars, right? We see a much larger, say, rush hour bump here uh, uh, on the weekdays. Same thing with this HOA, right? Much larger on, on, on weekdays. Um, but similarly, we see, see things like CO, right? Which we attribute to car traffic on, on weekdays. But we also see benzene, toluene, um, NOx, right? All these things, you see this, this sharp peak uh, during the weekdays that you don't see during the weekend. Interestingly, I, I find this one here, isoprene actually shows that peak as well. Right? Isoprene, we typically think of that as a biogenic molecule, but it's actually emitted from cars too. And when cars are your dominant source and isoprene's not a large fraction right, uh, from, from biogenic sources, then you can get a spike there. But then if we look at other things, right, some other species that, that we don't expect to have such a dependence on human activity differences between weekends and weekdays, we see smaller differences. So for example, acetyl nitrile here. This is a nice tracer for biomass burning. You don't necessarily expect people to burn more or less wood on the, on the weekends if it's predominantly used for home heating. Maybe if it was used for fun, right, for, for Christmas or whatever we might. But, um, but here we see a small difference. Right, if we look at the biomass burning factor here, at least for the, this, the second one here, you see much less of a difference overall. Right, the cooking, you don't see much of a difference overall. Right? And these inorganic species, you don't see much of a difference overall for the, for the, um, um, for the particles overall. So we can, un we can start to understand and tease out sources as well um, based on this type of uh, diurnal behavior and the composition-specific diurnal behavior going beyond just total PM. Um, so one last point, I think, on the on the surface measurements, right? Focusing here is that uh, we find that if we if we take all of our data for the month and we take it and we divide it up into uh, uh, bins by concentration. So on the left here is when you have lower concentration overall, right? So average of in this case. Uh, 7.1 7 mic 7 micrograms per cubic meter, right? And then 20 micrograms, 33 micrograms. So just kind of binning it um, uh, as a function of concentration. Uh, what we notice is that the fraction of organic here, right? The fraction of organic uh, in terms of a contribution to that total, right? Increases as the total concentration increases. So when you get these really high uh, concentrations of total PM over here, right? We see that it's dominated by uh, organic aerosol, right? 
you might guess then, you know, we also see then a shift from uh, where the secondary organic, right, the pink OOAs, uh, their fractional contribution to the total organic is decreasing as well and being replaced by the primary organic aerosols. So really you can think of this as you get the highest concentrations at night quite often when the primary emissions have the largest impact in your boundary layer. Your nocturnal layer is really shallow. Um, but then our average behavior is actually somewhere around here. Right? So these are, these are high events uh, overall. All right. So just to summarize for, for this part one here, right? one thing that we know is that these pollution events are spatially widespread uh, in the valley. Right? The particle composition is dominated by organic aerosol and inorganics, especially ammonium nitrate. Right? We kind of already knew that, but I think we've uh, been able to refine that a bit more. Um, we see that the OA is contributed from primary emissions, about 60%, but secondary uh, formation shouldn't be forgotten even in the wintertime. Secondary formation is important. And the primary, in this case, is coming from uh, biomass combustion, probably residential heating, uh, vehicles, and cooking. And these all contribute importantly. Um, one thing that we see is that these primary and secondary species, or the specific compositions, exhibit distinct di diurnal behavior. And that gives us a lot of insight into the sources uh, and the chemical processing that's going on. Um, and then one thing that we note is that these vehicle-associated species do show stronger weekend, weekday differences. So we can try to use that information as well to, to tease out contributions from sources. And then overall, when we get more PM, we tend to have larger contributions from organics, in particular from the primary uh, organics. I'll just stop for a minute. If there's any questions in the room, at least, for, for a moment before I move on to the next part. Earl Withercombe um, with ARB. Um, there was a significant difference between uh, biomass one and biomass two with respect to the weekday weekend distribution. Any thoughts about what was going on in, in um, biomass one um, or, the, or the differences, source okay. differences between those two? So in this case, um I don't have the time series here, but this biomass burning too was seen more consistently throughout the study, whereas biomass burning one, if I'm remembering correctly, was, was seen a bit more during kind of half the study than the other half. So in some sense, there's fewer weekends for biomass burning one than there is to biomass burning two in terms of that overall behavior. But I, um, it seems like these have some relationship with temperature outside as well, um, kind of what people are combusting, how hot they're running their, their, their um, stoves. Um, that's our hypothesis, as well as potentially some uh, signatures of chemical processing uh, in the atmosphere that are kind of retaining a biomass burning signature, but changing through processing uh, uh, perhaps overnight or during the day. And then we're seeing that again. Um, a second question. I was uh, especially intrigued by the fact that in the the highest uh, PM bin, um, cooking emissions were the largest single source. Was cholesterol an analyte in any of your analyses? Um, not specifically. Um, I'd have to talk with, with Chi to know whether cholesterol can be seen as a particular signature in the mass spectrum, although I suspect not. Any guess? Um, no. Yeah, I mean, I think it gets large. It's just we, we had a few nights during this study where we think that the, the nocturnal mix layer was really shallow, like 15, 20 meters shallow. So 
I think emissions just locally around there were just having such a large impact. And we weren't that far from some places that were cooking. We weren't that far from a highway. I mean, we were not sitting on top of them. But I think there's just some periods where just because it's so shallow that, that things that aren't even emitting, in a sense, all that much can lead to huge buildups in concentration. Uh, Dave Ridley, Cobb. Uh, so a couple of questions. I was just wondering what the kind of chemical signature is that separates out the, the cooking from just other biomass. Um, what is it that's been discriminated here by the, the PMF? Um, so I think, as, as Sonia mentioned, I think the PMF picks up on, on a, a, a particular ion uh, fragment um, that is distinct from uh, the, the biomass burning. Uh, spectra in the end. And I imagine there's also some differences in things like the 43, 44 ratios and all these other things. And I don't have them in this presentation, the spectra, but um, the spectra are all in the, in the paper and the report. But, um, but yeah, there's, I think there, there remain questions about, to me, at least I'm not an AMS expert, but about all of these separations because people have looked at other periods and not necessarily seen so much cooking and then and so there, there, there remain some, some questions. But I think, it, um, you know, just based on what we understand about the sources in the region, I think that this is a reasonable um, assignment. Um, and then just a second question. You, when you showed the events uh, in time, the, the two different events, it seems like there's kind of a gradual accumulation uh, going on over that time period before some kind of clearing out that, that occurs. I wondered whether um, the slide that you were, you were just on prior to this, uh, whether you see the kind of a, a change in the proportion of POA, SOA, and inorganics over that, um, over that event, and whether that's similar to, to the way you were fractioning things out from kind of lower concentrations to, to higher concentrations. Um, I'd have to look at how it changes over the course of the event. Um, we do know, and, and I don't have it shown explicitly here, but um, because of these differences in diurnal behavior, there's, I, I think the, the changes over from the day to night are much stronger than the changes across an event um, overall. Um, but yeah, the day-night the day changes, if you plot kind of all these on top of each other and normalize them, are, you know, the inorganics go up during the day, the organics go down. So in the second part, we'll actually talk a little bit about those buildups. Oh, another question. Uh, Great. Chris Jacob here with CARB. Um, were there any spare the air days that limited residential wood burning during these events? And if so, did the measurements tease out that impact? So um, yes, there were. And one of uh, Chi's former students was working on that. And there's a chapter in her dissertation on that. And um, the, I'll, I'll call them preliminary results so far, I think, um, uh, suggest that there are some differences. Um, but I can tell you that they're back out this winter, I think, or they're going back out right to try to understand this specific issue further. Yeah, that's... I haven't done that analysis myself, but in talking with, with, uh, with Chi and with Carolyn, it, Statistically, it becomes really challenging. And so you, you have to have longer term measurements to, to really help with that. And so um, you know, as, a, as a promo for some of our ongoing work, uh, in addition to the, PM, the routine PM measurements, we now have um, a, a, a monitoring version of an aerosol mass spectrometer in Fresno that will hopefully allow us to further address those issues. OK. So um, for the second part here, uh, what I'm going to talk about are our efforts to, to, to refine and better understand the processes that drive variability in the ammonium nitrate. Uh, specifically here. Although a lot of this thinking can be inverted to, to think about the organic aerosol uh, overall. And 
I'll just tell you up front, if you want all the details, please read Guy Reeves' paper, Prabhakar, at all, because it's actually really, it's a really nuanced story, and so I'm going to gloss over a lot of, a lot of things here today, but I'll, I'll try to convey the, the overall uh, message. And the thing with nitrate is that it, it continues to prove to be challenging to model. Some models do better than others, but um, some do quite poorly. This is just an illustration of a couple of different um, model outputs for the, the valley. Um, here, blue and green on the right are the model, and you can see, or the observations, and, and the red is the model of, of nitrate, and the model's way under. Right, and over here on the left, the red and the blue are some model simulations, and the green are the observations from Discovery AQ, and you can see they don't do very well. And so our goal is to try to use the observations, all of the observations that we have, to help refine the understanding so maybe we can improve the representation uh, overall. And so what I'm really going to talk about here is breaking down this diurnal profile that we observed into the processes that drive this behavior here overall. And I'm going to do this for this one, one period that we were there. And, and any other period that we look at might look a little different. But I think we're, we're trying to inform the processes and the behavior that we can apply uh, more broadly. So we're going to tell the story, really, of this diurnal profile as, as best we can here. You know, the things that we might note about this that we, that we want to explain. So one is we see this sharp increase right in the morning. Right? So starting around, uh, around 7, you know, uh, we see this increase up until about 10 or 11. Uh, it's really a, almost a doubling in the, in the concentration of, of nitrate there in the morning. Um, we see this peak. And then, and then a, a, a decrease that continues kind of over time, maybe a small afternoon bump there on the average. Um, um, and then, you know, relatively constant uh, overnight um, here. So not, not huge changes overnight in the end. So we're going to think about, well, what could contribute to all of that? So let's think about the processes that can possibly impact the surface uh, concentrations of ammonium nitrate. I'm just going to write AN sometimes here. So all the things you might expect, chemical production, of course, mixing and entrainment, uh, advection, and dry deposition. These are really the processes that we have to, to consider here. And the question is, which, you know, what role do all of them, them play? And what we really tried to do is to use observational constraints that we have from Discover AQ in terms of vertical profiles, surface measurements, um, to, to model all of these processes, right, to determine their absolute and their relative importance for this particular period, but hopefully uh, applying to others as well. And to use all of this to support a refinement of the conceptual model overall. So let's just step through some of these processes real quick, uh, and then we'll get into what we did. So particulate nitrate formation, Right? Uh, there's really two paths. Daytime, you need an OH to react with an NO2 to make nitric acid. And then you have a whole bunch of sources of OH here as well. Right? And that nitric acid then can partition to form ammonium nitrate. And the partitioning depends on the amount of ammonia that you have available. Nighttime, uh, you have a different chemistry going on because you don't have uh, OH. Instead, you have ozone can react with NO2, makes NO3. Uh, you can make some N2O5 here. And then that uh, N2O5 can heterogeneously react on particles uh, to give you uh, nitric acid uh, overall or to give you chlorine nitrate. And then once you make that nitric acid again, it can um, um, partition between the gas and the particle phases depending on the amount of ammonia. So what do we need to know? We need to know things like concentrations of NO2, of our oxidants, right, of our particles, because uh, in the end, we can think about these processes, and especially the nighttime one. The rate of the nighttime conversion here is going to depend on the particle surface area that we have for that heterogeneous reaction. And it's going to depend on the, the reactive uptake coefficient uh, overall. Basically, when an N2O5 comes in and runs into a particle, what's going to happen to it? Is it likely to react or not? That depends on the particle composition. And then, of course, it depends on the gas phase precursor concentrations. But the equilibrium state that we get, basically how much nitrate you have in the gas versus the particle phase, is going to depend on your ammonia to nitrate ratio uh, in the end. So you can end up, if you have excess ammonia, most of the stuff's in the particle phase. If you don't have enough ammonia, most of the stuff's in the gas phase. And that actually has some important implications here that we'll look at. Okay. 
So that's a little bit on the chemistry. Let's think about what's going on in the atmosphere overall, and then we'll put these together. So we can break this down really into the daytime and the nighttime here uh, behavior. So during the daytime, sun's out, it's heating the surface. We get mixing up to some certain uh, altitude. In this case, it's around 500 meters-ish is our daytime mix layer that we observed. Um, and then you have your free troposphere above it, which tends to be cleaner. And you might have some mixing uh, between those uh, going on as well, entrainment going on there as well. At night, you get a different picture. Uh, you get a decoupling between the surface mix layer. So you get a shallow surface mix layer here that's driven largely by uh, mechanical mixing. And then um, a, a residual layer here where things are pretty static, but where winds might be blowing through that. And then maybe very, very weak entrainment by here overall. So the point of this is really that you have different processes driving things during the day and the night in terms of what's mixing and where stuff is emitted uh, into. Okay. So let's break this down uh, into processes now, okay? into all these different processes. So we're going to look at this and think about this now in a time-dependent manner. So this is modified from Sally Pacetti's paper here. Um, uh, so we have our daytime mixed boundary layer, our nocturnal residual layer over here, and our nocturnal boundary layer down here illustrated. And let's think about the processes that we have going on. So first, within our, within our residual layer at night, right, that's when our N2O5 chemistry is going on. And this is where we can get particle production uh, going on aloft up here. Okay? We can get particle production in this aloft layer. But then we could also think about, well, what about particle production down here? What about nitrate production in the surface layer? And as I'll show here in a few minutes, basically, this doesn't matter a lot in a place like Fresno because you titrate away all the ozone very rapidly, so you have no N2O5 anymore. It's basically because you have such a shallow layer and you just pump NO into that surface layer. So you don't, you don't get uh, any N2O5 chemistry going on, or very, very little instance. And we can think about what happens when the sun starts to come up. So when the sun starts to rise, basically what happens is you take this surface mix layer, the shallow surface mix layer at first, and you just start to eat into this residual layer. You take what's in the residual layer and you pull it down to the surface. And you just kind of do that. You know, here we're showing it continuously. You can think of it as like you just keep grabbing different bits of this nocturnal layer and mixing it down to the surface. You're just kind of moving, marching up over time uh, overall. And one thing that I want to emphasize and we'll come back to is that the thinner this layer is, the more that your daytime is just going to look like whatever was up here, right? So what's up here can really dominate when this is really shallow. Okay, so that's what happens when we start to rise at sun, sunrise. Right during the day, though, now the sun's out, built up our mix layer, and we can suddenly have daytime photochemical production. Right? We might think OH is low in the winter, but it's not that low. It's not actually that low. You can still get this chemistry going on throughout this entire mix layer. Right? Similarly, during the daytime now, you've got, you've got some convection going on, and you can increase in, entrainment up here of clean air from your free troposphere as well. Think of that as a sink for your nitrate, because you take what's down here and you stick it out to the rest of the world, and we don't worry about it anymore. Right? Then we keep going through the day. Well, actually, during the day as well, we might also have, you know, temperatures are warm and things like that. So if we have some nitrate, uh, some gas phase nitrate around, that gas phase nitrate might actually deposit, dry deposit to the surface. If it does that, then the particles might evaporate in response. And then that, those gases might deposit. Why am I focused on the gases here? Because particle deposition is pretty slow relative to gases. So the loss of stuff to the surface is going to be largely driven by deposition of gases. But that's going to depend on how much of that nitrate we have in the gas phase. Versus okay. Then when the sun goes down, though, you stop your convective mixing, and you get a, a, a pretty rapid decoupling of your surface layer from your residual layer here. You can think of it this way, that this what was mixed throughout this entire region here just becomes your residual layer. right? moves over, and now it's basically decoupled from the surface. The emissions at the surface are not impacting it anymore. It's just hanging out, right, where chemistry can occur. Okay. And then you have emissions into your surface layer, but you can also have, now you have a much shallower layer from which you're depositing, and so you could actually have some enhanced deposition of nitric acid. 
So this is the, the big picture here, and we're going to try to break this down here as quickly as I can. So we try to characterize each of these processes to explain this diurnal profile. Um, again, I'm going to go through this quickly. Details are in the paper, right? But what did we have? We were able to constrain the nighttime and the daytime production as a function of altitude um, using our measurements of precursor gas concentrations, of sunlight, of relative humidity profiles, of temperature profiles, right? Of particle surface area, just illustrating that here, and particle composition. We could do this for daytime and nighttime as well. You might ask how we did that. Well, during the daytime, it's easy because we have this mixed layer. So what you measure at the surface is what you have aloft. How do we do that at nighttime, though, if we're measuring at the surface? And the plane wasn't flying at night as well. Well, basically, because we know that there's a decoupling that happens around sunset. So whatever you measure right around, say, this gray bar there, right around sunset, is just what ends up in your residual layer where the chemistry can occur. So you can actually use what, what things look like at the surface around sunset to say what the chemistry is going to look like overnight in that layer, okay? at least the first order. So we were able to, to constrain all of these and to constrain production rates uh, based on on all of this. So we can get at our chemical production term. What about mixing and entrainment here overall? Right? That, especially that daytime, that, that sunrise, right when the, when the boundary layer starts to rise and to eat into that, res, that uh, residual layer and bring it down to the surface. Well, we have um, uh, measurements of temperature, RH, CO, all sorts of things from this plane flying three times a day. Right? So we can at least put a point on here for what, what we measured as the boundary layer height at these three times. Right? And then we actually have measurements of the sensible heat flux from nearby, which actually tells us about how fast we're driving the mixing overall. And we can use that to drive um, a model of, of mixing here in the end to figure out how that mixed layer height is rising uh, from, from the nighttime to the daytime to figure out basically how, as this moves up, how we're entraining that, that air from aloft down to the surface. Not only that, we have our vertical profiles three times a day of the particulate concentration. So here's one day, again, with this black being morning. And then you see the evolution of the midday and the afternoon. And what you really see is we have this unique structure early on in the day. We have this unique structure, but it basically gets flattened out as we mix things up because we're just mixing entirely through there. So at night, when we're not mixing in this layer, we get this distinct shape overall. Okay. And all we do is as we move up, we just start eating into this black and then homogenizing it. So we can actually constrain that from our observations. What about advection? Well, just to go back here, I should say this, this shape here surprised us in the end because we actually predict that the chemistry in that vertical throughout that entire vertical column is basically the same. The differences in RH and temperature have almost no impact. So we would have expected this to be actually pretty flat production everywhere. Turns out that's not the case. And we think it's because there's differential advection going on um, as a function of altitude. So here, we are able to use um, wind profiler measurements to look at the, the horizontal wind speed as a function of altitude. And what you see is this very distinct shape here. Right, so wind speeds at the surface are low. Wind speeds go up to here and then go down again and then go up again overall. And this is actually moving stuff around in different ways as a function of altitude. It's pushing stuff out of the city, bringing in air from just outside the city that's a little bit cleaner. Not clean necessarily, but a little cleaner. We also see that the, the directionality is very different at the surface versus, say, 150 meters, 285 or 450 meters. So you see these, these shifts as well. And this all plays into if you take the average uh, wind speed as a function of altitude and you take the same concentration uh, the next uh, morning, right? So if you look at the concentration at a given altitude, you actually see this very strong relationship between wind speed and what you got in terms of your nitrate concentration. So basically, you're producing stuff at the same rate, but at some levels, you just blow it away. And at some levels, you don't. So some levels, you end up with net production, and some you end up with kind of a net what appears to be lost because of advection. So it's piecing those together. 
this dry deposition term, right? This dry deposition and loss of, of, of nitric acid to the surface. Well, what we, what we find is that first, most of the nitrate is in the particle phase. So we're definitely in, an, in, a, in, a, in a NOx limited region or a nitrate limited region. So we have excess ammonia everywhere. Right. It doesn't mean that all the nitrate, though, is in the, in the particle phase. It just means most of it is. But it also means it's really hard to budge this because we're in this flat region over here. So if, yeah, if you wanted to control nitrate by uh, adjusting ammonia, you have to basically drop your ammonia by a whole lot to, to, to move anything. But what, what matters here, though, is even if you only have, say, 5 or 10% of your nitrate in the gas phase, right? if you have 5%, over, say, five hours, if you just allow stuff to deposit in the, in the, in the fully mixed boundary layer, you lose, you know, 15% of your nitrate. But if you suddenly move up to 15%, you lose a lot more, 40% like of your nitrate. So even moving from 5% to 15% of your gas phase fraction can have a big impact. And it turns out, right, that th th this um, relationship, the gas phase fraction, depends on time of day. So at night, when it's cold and the RH is high, you push stuff to the particle phase. And during the day, when it's warmer, uh, you move stuff out of the particle phase. And we actually have observations of this from uh, Carolyn Parworth here, where she has her, her day and her nighttime measurements. These are the campaign averages, but we can actually calculate these based on thermodynamic principles day after day to, to think about this. So this, what this ends up meaning is that during the day, you have stronger potential for dry deposition than at night. At night, it's actually really small, and that's why things are flat at night. But right, when, right at, at, at sunset, you can have an impact. OK. So that's a really quick summary of all the processes that we considered, how we tried to consider them. So let's add them together, and, and let's just try to summarize all this. Uh, and we'll try to summarize it in two different ways and then, and then add it together. So first, let's summarize this in terms of how is this going to play out in terms of time of day? And then we'll think about the individual processes. So these are linked. So nighttime, right? what we have going on at nighttime, we think, kind of in our conceptual model, is there's very limited chemical production of ammonium nitrate at the surface because you titrate all your ozone away. So we don't have to worry too much about, at least currently, about the surface uh, at night. But you get strong chemical production above the surface. And that chemical production is largely set by what you had the previous day around sunset. So whatever you end up with in that, your ozone especially, right then, it really matters. But we also see that at night, there's an altitude-dependent advection term, which tends to decrease ammonium nitrate in the precursor gases uh, relative to what you started with, because it's just a little bit cleaner outside the city. But you tend to have limited loss via dry deposition because at low temperatures and higher H, so after you're done making stuff up high at night, at sunrise, you entrain that stuff to the surface, and you can suddenly get a rapid increase in your nitrate concentration at the surface because you're entraining everything you made overnight. Um, but that's going to depend, that exact change that you see is going to depend on how thin your boundary layer is, how much vertical or how much horizontal adduction impacted things, what the difference is between basically your initial surface concentration and your concentration just above the surface as you entrain that. Then as you go on uh, to the afternoon, you're going to have photochemical production of nitric acid continuing, kind of keeping things up a little bit, and production of ozone, which is important. But, um, but then entrainment also increases during the daytime of the free troposphere air. So that actually decreases things a little bit. And you do get, I, I don't have it on here, I apologize, but some dry deposition going on during the daytime as well when it's hot. And then at sunset, um, sunset's a special period where your mixing is shutting down very rapidly. So you actually can still have relatively high temperature in RH for a brief period, but then you suddenly have a very shallow mix layer. And so you can actually have a, a small period of enhanced dry deposition that can be quite important uh, in the end. And of course, at sunset is when you're setting the stage for the next day's chemistry. That's kind of the time-dependent picture. We could think about this in the process-dependent picture here. This is just another way to say all these same things. But instead, I'll focus on the graphs down here, which is 
The blue is our observations, and the green is, is our model that we didn't tune in any way. We kind of tried to constrain from all the observations, and I think if we really wanted to, we could tune this to figure out things exactly, but we were trying to do things a little more a priori. And what you see is we get this sharp rise in the morning, largely driven by mixing, some decline afterwards, which is just eating into different parts of the, of the um, vertical structure, but then this remains elevated because we get chemical production during the day, not as elevated as it would if we didn't have um, entrainment of free troposphere air and some loss overall, and then, and then some faster loss uh, at the surface from dry deposition uh, right around uh, sunset overall. And in the end, if we piece these together, just to come to this side, kind of this is, this is a picture for one day. So we start with stuff at the surface, and then as we move through, we have our nocturnal chemistry over here. So, you know, originally that, that is most of what you have. Right? As you start to go into the day, it's what the, the nighttime is what matters. But as the day goes on, you start to make more nitrate due to photochemistry. And by the end of things, in the end, we end up with, at least for this episode, 50-50 nominally from daytime versus nighttime uh, uh, chemistry going on. Right? Now, this picture will change a little bit for any given event. Right? But um, I think the general picture stands. And this can help us to understand the buildup of pollution overall, right? Or, or why, in some cases, you don't see a buildup, but you just see like a relatively flat level. It's really about the difference between what you have here and what you end up with here, OK? It doesn't matter how high we get up here, right, uh, in terms of kind of the day-by-day buildup. And that's because this is, this is where you start and then you mix stuff down and you end up there. Then you have some loss processes, but also some production processes. And by the end, when you reset that residual layer, you can think of this as like this is where you were, and then you reset your residual layer, which dominates the next day, that difference is what really matters there in the end. So if that difference is zero between, say, the you know, sunrise and sunset, then your episode will just be flat and it won't increase over time. If that difference is is bigger, it'll go, go up. Because this, this really illustrates the combination of the processes day after day. And you end up with, you know, here if we look over the campaign average, or this event average, it's about 1.3 micrograms per day. And that's pretty much 1.3 micrograms right there as that, as that difference. So just to summarize kind of um, part two here, right? Key processes that we think are important in this conceptual model is altitude-specific nocturnal chemical production and advection. Kind of those coupled have to be uh, really important. Uh, daytime chemical production can't be neglected. OH is substantial. Um, mixing and entrainment, kind of getting that mixing and entrainment is really right, is really important um, uh, to get if you want to get the diurnal profile right. Um, but also we need to think about entrainment of the clean air. Um, that is important to consider. That is kind of a sink for the, the local pollution. Right? We export it to the rest of the planet. Um, but that time-dependent dry deposition and repartitioning of ammonium nitrate is important. So we have to consider the time dependence for that. Um, overall, if we kind of think about everything that we did, right? there's a lot of source and process-specific information embedded in these composition-specific diurnal profiles. Uh, we've really tried to mine those. And then the specifics of the pollution buildup are going to vary by location depending on the specific contributions of all of these, but, but the processes uh, should be uh, similarly. And I think, in fact, some of this, uh, we can explain some of the differences in how pollution events build up between Bakersfield and Fresno, but that's all kind of vague thinking. So anyway, um, yeah, that's all I got. Any questions about part two? Um, so is there any, have you any thoughts on what may be going on at nighttime where the model doesn't quite, it, it looked like there was still a bit of a bump in the observations at night and the model didn't quite capture that? Um, yeah, I, I don't, so why, why would the model? So you're, you're thinking, like, why did, you know, this particular, um, uh, we'll go back. 
So it has a little bump in the morning or at night, right? Um, oh, actually, so if you just go to the next slide. Oh, yeah. I was going to say here, I think it's because they don't titrate their ozone entirely. Right? Oh, oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. Because if you don't titrate your ozone entirely, then you'll get surface production of, of uh, nitrate. Right. So that's probably the, the difference here where you can yeah. still see the... This one, you, this one? Yeah, yeah. I think this is a transport phenomenon. Ah, uh, right. So I think it's that we have fairly consistent behavior during the day, and then I think as the winds are shifting, I think we actually just bring something back on itself a little bit, um, or from like a slightly different region of, of Fresno. Um, it'd be interesting to do this a little bit kind of outside of the city, where we're not going to be sub, quite so subject to, to things. But I, I think that's a transport uh, phenomenon. And, and you can see some, when you look at that bump, so this bump, this daytime bump is fairly consistent day to day. This one is way more variable. Very interesting talk, Chris. Thanks. <clears throat> so do you have any insights as to why you're getting this slow increase over time for the pollution episode? I mean, is it just shallower and shallower boundary layers each day? Is there more and more production? Like, what, what is causing it to increase slowly over time? Yeah, I mean, broadly speaking, I would just think of it as the difference between um, uh, production and loss, right? And so here, um, the, the, the loss terms, right, the, the dry deposition, the advection. I mean, advection gets you a little bit, but then you end up just mixing it and bringing it back. So it's not as good of a loss term, in a sense, as, as uh, dry deposition or entrainment. So I think it's just those processes aren't keeping up with the uh, with the production terms, and you know what we what we don't see in you know if I go back to um, somewhere, <laughs> if I go back here, right? It, we we don't have the very beginning of this episode um, where we started. I mean, I, I can get that from the total PM measurements from the ARB network, but or actually, I think we have that back back here. Just to, I didn't. Oh, no. Um, but I think what happens is sometimes you just end up in, there we are, some conditions where kind of things were different and suddenly you, you, you flip a switch where suddenly your, your, either your loss term plummets or your production term goes up. It's probably the loss term plummeting to some extent. Um, and, you, and you can in some, in some areas like um, uh, Fresno, I mean, we don't, have the, the data for this first buildup. But in general, Fresno shows these faster buildups. And then flatter versus Bakersfield, which shows a more continuous buildup. And, and, I, and I think that that's just you, you kind of just change something. And in one case, suddenly your production is much higher than your loss temporarily. And then it's sustained. And the other, it kind of builds up over time. And it, if you look at the, if you look at the vertical profiles of morning nitrate or morning PM between these two sites, they're very different. And I think that that has a lot to do with it and where they're situated in the valley. So if we um, go back, find any, any vertical profile here, um, we should have one somewhere, right? Slides. So this, this black here, right, this, this sharp profile, we see that quite regularly in Fresno. And you get net production here and then kind of some net loss here. And if you look in, in Bakersfield, the, the early morning profile, as early as we could get there, looks more like these. More like it's just kind of moving up and down and around. So when you when you start to mix stuff in, I think you're not you're not um, moving as much stuff away through advection. You're kind of building it there. So you just kind of keep building a little more. Yeah, I, the, I think the vertical profiles have a lot of information. So I have another question. In the beginning of your talk, you focused a lot on basically the chemistry. Is there any feedback or connection between the organics and the ammonium nitrate? Is there a connection between those two stories? Um, what, I, what I can say is that, um, yeah, if we look at the, the um, especially some of the 
the LVOOA. Um, or no, the, the SVOOA, right? It, it has a diurnal profile that looks a bit more like the inorganics. Um, and this one a, a bit less. And I think, I think what we have is that this SVOOA is, is, has some similar dynamics going on. Right? I don't know exactly what the chemical pathway is to form it, but it seems like it has something similar going on where it's being formed overnight, and then this is probably due to mixing down uh, as well, largely with then some continued daytime production. Whereas I think this one is more of just a regional thing that kind of just keeps swirling around. And so I, I think it depends on which of those those oxygenated organics that we look at. Um, but yeah, I think, I think at least one of the factors is reflecting not necessarily the same process, but the same dynamics, at least. Uh, so just following on from that, really, so do you see, in the same way that you see with nitrate, that kind of gradual accumulation of similar thing with the LVOA, where that would, if that's kind of sloshing around in the basin, that, that kind of gradually accumulates? I have to look at that again. I don't, I don't recall whether that's just, whether that's following the same thing. But I, I do believe that there is, like, if you look at the R squared between nitrate and the SVOA, I think that there's a reasonable correlation between them. But I'd have to look to see whether it builds up. Thanks. Uh, wondering about the uh, aloft wind speed uh, being value below which um, it allows build up to occur over multi day event versus. That's a that's a good question. I guess you know I haven't thought of it that way, but we could you know we could guess here. So um, so if we look at um, where do I want to go? So if we look at here, right? We we definitely see that there's a relationship between what we see at a given altitude. So this is the average over the event at each altitude um, of the morning time flight, right? And then this is the mean wind speed overnight. And so we could compare, you know, what's this concentration relative to the mean nighttime surface nitrate, which I think is around 10 micrograms per cubic meter. And so, you know, when it looks like when you're um, above, you know, nominally a meter per second, you're tending to end up with less nitrate than you had at the surface. And if you're, say, less than a meter per second, then you're ending up with more nitrate than you had at the surface. And so I guess, I mean, you know, just kind of ballpark about a meter per second is, is, a, is a difference between where you move stuff, you move enough stuff out and replace it with cleaner enough air that the net production is negative relative to the surface. Thought of it there. So it looks like, yeah, a meter per second or so. Hi, Chris. Uh, a quick question. So the oxygenated OA could also be due to processed POA, correct? Not entirely necessarily from the traditional SOA from, you know, gas phase VOC oxidation. Um, some people say that. I, I don't think that's what we have in this case, and and I can I, I'll, I'll tell you why. So um, one of the reasons I don't think that's the case here is because if we look at the source of say this BBOA two, right, which which is more of the mass than the BBOA one, right, the concentrations are high at night, and why are they high at night? Because the boundary layer is really shallow, right. But as soon as we increase that, that mixed layer and, and, and go from 20 meter 
mixed layer height to 500 meter, right? There's none of it. So we don't have anything here to convert to OOA because it's, although the concentrations at the surface are really high at night, the kind of concentration throughout the column is small. And so, yeah, you'd have to have a lot more of it in order to, to, to make that much OOA from converting, say, the primary to the secondary. Does that make sense? Yeah, it's like, it's like if I took this stuff here at night where I'm, say, at seven micrograms per cubic meter in a 20 meter uh, mix layer, but then I suddenly dilute that to 500 meters and suddenly down to like 0.2 or whatever, 0.5 micrograms per cubic meter. And I'd somehow have to turn that 0.5 into four or two over there as a sustained concentration. So it's this, it's this issue of concentration that we measure at the surface versus the concentration in kind of the column or the, the daytime surface column. So I don't, I don't think that the primary is the, I don't think it's a conversion story in this case. I, th I think the BBOA1 might be a little bit of conversion from BBOA2. It's more oxygenated. So this is going to be a very speculative question, but so, you know, we have this problem in the valley. If you had a blank check to help investigate more on how to solve this problem or you know what would you do what would you look for what are the big unknowns that we need to figure out so that we can improve air quality in the valley so um for me i think the sources of these are not well known so we we played around with this a little bit we didn't explore them in detail but using like the measurements that we had from the PTRMS or from canister sampling or things like that. And it was really hard to make this much mass. And so, you know, again, we didn't, we didn't dig into that really thoroughly, but it, there seemed to be some definite missing gaps here. And I can tell you from some of the unpublished modeling work that I've seen, I don't think they make much SOA at all in the model in the winter. Um, because their emissions, are, I think, are really low, uh, biogenics. So I think that there's, and, and, and I pick on these because I don't think we know a lot about them, but they're 40% of the organics. You know, during the cleaner periods, maybe not during the crazy dirty, but they're more consistent, consistently there, right? Kind of always there, not, not so subject to boundary layer fluctuations. Um, so I, I think this is one place where we, um, uh, need to know a lot, a lot more. Um, you know, I, I do think trying to understand the extent to which spare the air days help or, or are, are being effective, you know, just to, I, I think that's important uh, well. And it might be interesting, you know, if I, if I had a, a blank check and a magic wand to think about spare the air days in the context of this as well, you know, whether be a bigger issue, right? Telling people not to cook in certain ways on spare the air days. <laughs> but um, uh, you know, it, at least it seems to be a pretty substantial uh, contributor uh, as well. Um, so those would be a, a, a couple of other things here. I think, um, I mean, I think that there's a lot of power in, 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 in happy to say we're doing this, in making these types of measurements over longer periods of time. Because, you know, I focused on one diurnal profile today, and I can tell you they don't all look like that for all episodes. And I think that that's because, um, because what's going on vertically, especially in that vertical layer, isn't um, reshaping the, the, the advection isn't reshaping the, the distribute or the vertical profile in the same way. And so, when you mix it, when you start mixing things, you know, you, you either don't increase or even decrease or stay the same in the morning. And I think there's a lot of information to be learned about uh, what's going on, especially with these uh, secondary species um, 
that can come from, from advanced monitoring of, of composition. Yeah, more vertical profiles <laughs> as well. It'd be really nice to um, I think to have more routine, more routine understanding of that of that vertical distribution, and and we can get some of that from remote sensing. Um, doesn't quite get you the very low levels, but you know maybe complementing that with with as high as we can get with with drones or something, um, or maybe even and that focus on on kind of these transition periods. Um, so the question is, based on the week, weekday weekend differences, it seems that vehicles dominate the SVOOA formation in winter. Uh, let's see here. What do we have here for SVOOA? Um, I, I, I don't think so. I mean, um, this peak is not the typical rush hour uh, peak in the SVOOA. That's more of the, the mixing peak, I think, from um, entrainment of the of the mix layer, it's a little bit late for the, um, the and, and not sharp enough for that um, there, although, it, and, and I think that you have to see more of a connection between um, conversion time scales and emissions for that to be true. Because if you have to emit it and then have it converted chemically to another form, then you'd always expect a lag uh, anyway. So, I think it's hard to attribute secondary things uh, to a source based on that type of information. And then it says, in terms of improving air quality to meet EPA standards, shall we control NOx or primary POA? Which way is more effective? Um, I mean, the POA, right, uh, pretty clearly dominates these very high periods. It's a question of what fraction of the day those correspond to and how those play out in terms of the daily average. Um, you know, but the, the, the nitrate is a bit more consistent here. Things I didn't have a chance to go into today, Sally Pacetti has done some really nice work suggesting that if we reduce NOx more, it's likely to impact the nocturnal chemistry a lot more than the daytime chemistry in the near term, um, largely because your decrease in NOx is offset by changes in in oxidants uh, for the daytime, so your your production, your daytime production won't necessarily change very much relative to the nighttime. So NOx is a little uh, tricky that way. But the, you know, the, and then also if we look at kind of when we hang out in this, you know, 32 to 45 microgram range, right, right when we're near the, the transition um, between exceeding the, the daily average limit, you know, there's still a fair, fairly large contribution of these secondary species. So the primary aren't, aren't the major, major drivers right around there, right? And that's where we have um, most of the data, these extreme events where these dominate are, are fewer and far between. So I'd have to give that more thought, like how, we, how, to, how to think about what you're averaging and when you're averaging it to figure out what the Um, and then just one last point with that is thinking about, um, if, we, if, if we think about this multi-year perspective or the annual perspective, not just the, the, the one-day exceedances, but the annual perspective. I mean, this is Fresno. I think, you know, Bakersfield is, is, is a little higher, but the annual averages are all hovering, you know, they bounce between, bounce above and below 15. And the thing that strikes me is, you know, in an annual average, these points certainly add up, but your summertime here is hanging out at 10 as well. So if, if we're focused on an annual average, if this summertime was zero, then the annual average would be lower and, and the winter would have less of an effect. So I think understanding what's going on in the summer is also really important for, from, from a regulatory uh, perspective. And then we're seeing we're gonna have to deal more and more with these fires as well, right? You see these popping up uh, earlier and earlier and then going later and later. And those are gonna 
make things increasingly challenging, although I think you can get exceptions for those, right? Um, so uh, a, a question uh, is that the, the AQI is currently uh, 160 in Fresno at 9.30. Yeah, and the question is why? Because of the combination of all these factors. Um, I don't know if it rained. Did, does anybody know did it rain there um, like it did here? I mean, to wash things out, because they were starting to collect smoke on a delayed uh, time frame from up here. And if it didn't rain down there, then they've probably got that, plus then getting increasingly into wintertime conditions. And so there's probably some buildup going on. Um, For, for the seminar, it's a very interesting talk, and uh, certainly I encourage everyone to read the papers and to look further at his final report online. Thank you.